stories for children of all ages. A lot of these children have white beards. Of, uh, the, the, uh, <laughs> the, the, um, and we have this week, we have the amazing, the phenomenal, the legendary Liz Weir. Over to you, Liz. Thank you very much. Uh, this evening, I'm going to do exactly what it says on the tin. There are going to be stories for children. The big children can listen in, of course. But the idea is that perhaps some of the younger children will listen at a later stage. This morning, I've been telling stories to 80 second year education students at a teacher training college. So my children's stories are honed and ready. And I thought tonight I'd tell some of my favorites. And I thought I'd start with a little magic because I really like magical stories. And the story I'm going to start with was told to me by a seven-year-old. So I'm going to share it with you. Hopefully one day it's going to be a picture book, but for now, you're going to get it straight from her to me to you. A long time ago, when the world was new, there was a rainbow fairy. She kept her rainbows in a box on her kitchen table. Whenever the, the weather was right for rainbows, she'd open the box and whoosh, the rainbow would go into the sky. When it was time for the rainbow to come back, she had a special magic whistle that she'd go and the rainbow would come back. But the rainbow fairy got a really bad cold, sore throat, sore head, <coughs> a bit like me, <coughs> that wasn't intended. <coughs> so she went off to bed with a hot lemon drink and she left her rainbows on the kitchen table. Now, it was a blue sky day, so she wouldn't have been working that day anyway. But next door to her, there was a very nosy fairy. And I'm sure all you adults know someone who's very nosy. Somebody who always peeps out from behind the curtains, looks out from behind the blinds. Well, this nosy fairy wonders something that I'm quite sure John has asked himself over the years. What does a rainbow look like when it's not out? He wondered, she wondered if the colours were all jumbled up together, you know, like cotton candy. Or if there was side by side in the box, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, you know, a bit like Play-Doh in a box. So the nosy fairy sneaked in. She knew the fairy was sick and she opened the box. Shoom! Out shot the rainbow. Come back, come back, she said. But it was way out the door into the sky. But of course, the rainbow wasn't going to come back because she didn't have the magic whistle. So she ran home, locked her door, hid under the table and thought it would come back. Not one bit of it. The rainbow was out for the day. It wasn't coming back. So the queen of the fairies was sitting up in her castle, eating her crunchy nut cornflakes, looking out the window, and she said, what's a rainbow down out in a day like this? And she marched around to the fairies' house and hammered on the door. The little voice said, <coughs> come in. Rainbow fairy, come down. Queen, I'm, I'm sick. I'm in bed. Come down at once. It's your queen speaking. What could you do? The rainbow fairy got out of bed, put on her fluffy slippers, got her big dressing gown, her bathrobe on, and came down the stairs. And the queen said, your rainbow's out. She said, I'm not working today, queen. I'm in the sick. I've got a sore throat. Get it back. So she produced the silver whistle and blew, and the rainbow glided back into the box, and they closed it. But now the hunt started. Who did it? Was it Mike? Was it Baba C? Oh, I bet it was that desk no one. Oh, maybe John Rowe. But anyway, she looked in and under the table was the nosy fairy hiding in her house. And the queen said, come out of that. You did it. She said, I was only looking, queen. I was only looking, looking. You're always looking at other people's business. I am going to give you the perfect job for you. Your new job. Listen carefully. You have to go all around the world. Whenever you find a house with a little boy or a little girl sleeping, shh, don't wake them. Sneak in, lift up their pillow. And if there's a tooth there, leave some money and bring that tooth back to me. So that is how the tooth fairy started her job. And it's one of my favourite stories. And I'm wondering, I don't know what you do with teeth and grease, Despin. I don't know if you, if you put them under pillows. I don't know what you do all over the world. Baba C, would you have put teeth under a pillow? Uh, yes. I would hope so. I hope you got money. Despina says yes as well. Some places they throw them up onto roofs. Other places they bury them. Whenever I'm working with children from different backgrounds, I ask them what they do. What about you, Mike? Would you have put teeth under your pillow? Would that have been right? 
Well, these days it's in a jar, but yes, in those days it would have been under a pillow. Oh, it has to work. No, here it's under a pillow, definitely. No jars, not at all. Not at all. People are giving them wee pouches and things. Our fairies aren't so fussy about that. They don't need that. As long as there's a tooth under the pillow, that works. And, you know, I used to tell that story an awful lot when my friend Louise was very small. And Louise and her brother James were very competitive. This is absolutely true now. And I'm going to do a picture book on this one day. James kept losing teeth. And every time he lost a tooth, he got money. And every time he got money, he bought magazines, he bought stickers. And she was really fed up. Um, Louise kept trying her teeth and trying her teeth, but she was too young. The teeth weren't going to come out at all. And then one night, and this is as true as I am sitting here in Cushendall, County Antrim, Northern Ireland. What she did, she tore a bit of kitchen paper and she rolled it up and she put it under her pillow. And you know what was there the next morning? A note that said, do you think I'm stupid? Signed, the tooth fairy. So she never tried that one again. So they're very, very sneaky, these tooth fairies. That's an, that is actually a true story. That's a true one. Um, so a lot of my stories um, have been given to me by friends over the years. And I always like to remember the people that tell me stories because you can keep their memory going after they've gone. And uh, there are two stories in this wee book of mine, here, there and everywhere, stories from many lands. Two stories in it which I got from the woman to whom I dedicated the book. Her name was Nancy DeVries, a fine storyteller and friend. And Nancy DeVries lived in Michigan, and I used to go over there and tell stories with her, and she came to visit me. But sadly, she didn't live to make old bones. But I tell her stories in her memory. And the first one I'm going to tell is a commonly told story. And lots of storytellers tell it. But if you've never been to Northern Ireland, right in the middle of the north part of Ireland, there's a big lake and it's called Loch Ness. Now, it's not Loch Ness, it's not Lone the Monster, Loch Ness. And years ago when I was 10, a long time ago, I got my first story published and it was about Loch Ness. I wrote it to a magazine. And the story I got published was that our big giant, Finn McCool, was fighting a Scottish giant. So he scooped up a handful of soil and he threw it over to Scotland and it missed. And it landed in the middle of the Irish Sea. And it became an island known as the Isle of Man. And where he scooped out the soil, filled up with water, and that became Loch Ness. Well, would you believe it, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls? I was given a tennis record for that. And because I'm a very old person now, but also I'm from a place called Ballymena, where we're very thrifty. Do you know what? I've still got that tennis, tennis racket. So there you are, a long, long time ago. But the story I'm going to tell you is about Loch Ness, and it's about a fisherman. The fisherman's name was Seamus, and he used to take his boat out in Loch Ness, and he'd catch lots of fish. He'd catch pollen and different sorts of fish, even those big Loch Ness eels. But the problem was, when the weather turned and the storm started, Loch Ness is so big, it becomes like a sea. And so it was too dangerous for Seamus to take his boat out. So what could he do? What he decided to do, was cut wood and sell it round the doors. Didn't make that much money, but it kept the wolf from the door. So he was out there, chop, chop, chopping around the lost shore. And what happened? His old axe splash went into the water. And Seamus had had, he just sat down and he started to cry. But all of a sudden he heard a voice saying, what's wrong with you, Seamus? And he looked and there was a tiny boat. And in the tiny boat, an even tinier fisherman, it was a fairy. The fairy said, what's wrong with you? Why are you crying? He said, I lost my axe. Hmm. Would you like me to get it for you? And of course, Seamus, being a very, very polite man, said, yes, please. So the little fairy took a fishing rod. And I don't know how many of you fish here, but you can help me with it if you like. He took his fishing rod and he cast it out of this. Whoosh, and when he started to reel back, reel back, reel back, reel back, oh, look at those fishing people. There in the end was an axe and it was made of gold. Is this your axe, Seamus? Oh, no, no, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Seamus, but no, thank you. My axe wasn't made of gold. Oh, let's try again. Ready, everybody? One, two, three. Reel it back, reel it back, reel it back, reel it back, reel it back. And there in the end, you'll not be surprised to know, storytellers, there was an axe made of silver. Is this yours? No, no, no. Mine's only an old axe. No, no, thanks very much. Anyway, third time, Lucky, it is a story after all. Let's go one, two, three. Reel it back, reel it back, reel it back. And there was Seamus's old axe. Oh, oh, thank you so much, said Seamus. That's very kind. Do you know, said the fairy, you're a very honest person. 
honesty should be rewarded. And bing, 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 there on the shore was the golden axe, the silver axe, and Seamus's old axe, and the fairy disappeared. Now, Seamus really didn't need a gold and silver axe. He sold them, he made a lot of money, and the word got round. But he had a friend called Michael. Michael was not a kind person. Michael was a very greedy person. And Michael thought, <laughs> I can have some of that. So he went to his shed and he took out an old rusty saw for saw in the wood. And he carried it down to the shore and he sat down and he did that old pretend crying thing. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It just drives me mad. We call it here fiffin. It's sort of this. Because <laughs> there's no point in pretending to cry if nobody sees you. What's wrong, said a voice. And sure enough, sure enough, there in the boat was the fairy. And he, he started that old fiff and crying again, which I know Marilyn McPhee doesn't like that old. <laughs> he said, <laughs> I lost my saw, did you, said the fairy, did you? And I suppose you'd like it back again. And he said, yes. You'll notice, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, what he didn't say. I'm sure she had noticed. He never said please. The fairy gave him a look. And then get your fishing rods ready, everybody. Got the fishing rod and shh. Reel it back, reel it back, reel it back, reel it back. And there on the end was the most gorgeous golden saw. Is this sure saw? Yes, it is, said Michael. Mm. Indeed, it is not, said the fairy. You know as well as I do, your saw wasn't made of gold. With that, the fairy, the fishing boat and the saw disappeared. Seamus and his family lived happily ever after. But of course, Michael had to go and buy himself a brand new saw because it served him right. And that's the story. One of my favourite wee stories. And that's dedicated to the memory of Nancy DeVries, the first heard a version from her, and many, many storytellers tell it. But it's a really lovely story to get boys and girls up sharing stories. They love to get up and dramatise that story and tell it. And uh, part of my job as a storyteller, and many of you are the same, it's not just us telling stories and aren't we wonderful. It's about getting the children up to share stories. And that was my privilege also in Morocco when I was there in Marrakesh, a wonderful festival, to get the young people retelling the stories. And some of you know we had interpreters there and the interpreters um, helped us with the stories. But some of the teenagers we were working with, their English was very good. And it was my pleasure to be with the wonderful Despina who's on with us in the call. We had such fun in the school. So as I said at the beginning, I'm going to stick strictly, strictly to the brief of stories for children because, um, you know, I tell a lot of adult stories, but today I was out sharing a lot of, of children's stories and, and I really love to do that. So I thought what I'd do is just try you out. Um, the story I'm going to tell you again, it's one, where did I first hear that? Oh, well, it's a folk tale, it comes from Africa. There are many, many versions of it, but the version that I have in this book here, there and everywhere is one that I like. But what you have to do, you have to be a thunderstorm. Now, I can only watch you. I can watch Sue be in a thunderstorm. She'll be good at being, I know Sue will do it. She's very good. You have to sort of go. <coughs> Did we see the hands going up? That's, oh, you see, I knew Sue would do it very well. Those Texans, they do great thunderstorms. They have great thunder anyway. Oh, Shane, you would know all about thunderstorms when you're out and about in the forest. So this is a story I told today, and I really love it. And I had 80 second year education students and you know they're a bit self-conscious i was talking to the day about this and i was saying people relax enjoy the stories join in and so they did but it was really really very funny a point i made to them i'll just share with you now i said to him do you know you're going to be teachers do you remember your best teacher and many of them nodded and here <laughs> i said you have the chance to be the best teacher for the child you will teach and I hope, I said, if you forget everything else I've told you, remember that. Remember how special you'll be to children if you treat them with respect. So here's the story. A long time ago, on the great continent of Africa, the sky was so low you could reach up your hand and touch it. And at that time, in that place, you could break bits off and you could eat it. Any flavor you fancy? Mango, pineapple. Of course, the children always throw in Oh, chocolate and vanilla. But anyway, everything. And it was good for two reasons. One, it didn't matter if it rained too much or not enough rain. There was plenty of food for everybody, plenty to go around. And then also, you see, the animals quite liked it as well because they were able just to eat away. 
But some people are very, very greedy. And there was a woman there called Odisi, and she was so greedy. And one night she'd had a perfectly good meal, but this happens to me sometimes, sometimes it happens. But a wee while later, she was hungry again. A night she went and broke off a huge bit of sky. And she tried to eat it, but she couldn't. So she threw it on the rubbish heap. And over the weeks and months, the rubbish heap got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until one night there was a terrible thunderstorm. <laughs> Everybody sat up and they heard a voice saying, tell your people to stop wasting me. They don't tell your people to stop wasting me. They'll see what will happen. Oh, people said, no, oh, it's the sky god. So people were nibbling just tiny bits. But you know what? You still got those people. Odyssey was still greedy. And one night, again, she'd had a perfectly adequate meal. She went out and she broke off a huge piece of sky. And she realized she couldn't eat it. And she called her children and said, can you help? And they said, no, mommy, we're stuffed. We can't eat it. No, we can't. So she sneaked out after dark. She thought that would do the trick. And she set up on the rubbish heap. Now that night, and I hope you people are all ready, there was a thunderstorm to end all thunderstorms. Oh. And people waited. No voice came and they went. <sighs> but when they went outside the next morning, the first thing they felt was the hot sun. When they looked up there, high above them, was the distant sky. And that's where the sky has stayed ever since. Thank you. One of my favorites, why the sky is far away. And uh, think about that story, you know, at these education students, there was green as grass, you know, sitting there. They're just back from teaching practice. And I said, what's that story really about? You know, and, uh, you know, and then somebody said, being greedy, not wasting the earth's resources. And I was going, yeah, brilliant, 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 brilliant. Oh, good, Babasi, I'm glad you tell a version. Great. That's the beautiful thing about stories. And that's what I love when you're together with a lot of storytellers. You can share the different versions of it. And uh, do you know, where was I? No, oh, last night. Last night, we've had a wonderful storyteller called Kath Little, who's listening in my kitchen. I see her name here, so I know she's listening in the barn kitchen. And uh, Kath was absolutely brilliant. But Sharon Dixon, one of my dear friends, got up and told a story, a real signature story of mine, which she shared most beautifully, called The Lord of Bembo. And it was just lovely to sit and listen to somebody else's interpretation of the story. Because, as I say to people all the time, it's not a competitive sport. Some people forget that. It's not a competitive sport. Everybody can put their own version of the story up there. And uh, I thought I'd tell you a story. My first book was called Boom Chicka Boom. 1994, long time ago now. I suppose I've been telling stories, huh? Oh, uh, 52 years, I think it is now. But um, when I did that book, obviously it was inspired by some young American students that used to come and work at peace camps and things in Belfast instead of boom, chicka, boom, is that a boom, chicka, boom, is that a boom, chicka, rabbit. Anyway, I get everyone to do it with Belfast accents, which is good. Say a boom, chicka, rocket, chicka, rocket, chicka, boom. And to see all these very polite students today doing it in broad Belfast accents was fun. <clears throat> but I put some of my favorite stories in it. And people say, is it hard to get a book published? Well, these days it is pretty hard. But when I started off way back, a long time ago then, um, the publisher actually asked me to put my stories into a book, which was sort of refreshing, which it was as easy these days. But anyway, um, I put some of my favorite stories and they'll be well-known stories to many, many, many people here. And one that I want to tell you, I'll tell you this one. I so said, don't tell them the name of the story. So there was once a little girl. She was a young woman who was a, a farmer's daughter and uh, life was hard on their farm. And so as soon as Ginny got to be the age where she'd go and be hired out, off she'd have to go to the hiring fair, a bit like a cattle market. Young men, young women standing there, bundles under their arms, and a farmer would pick up the boy or girl, take them off to his farm, and that young person or older people even would have to work on that farm for six months before they got a penny. They'd get their food and they'd get a bed. Some masters and mistresses were good, some weren't. But you see, if you even worked for five months, three weeks, six days, and you left, you wouldn't get a penny if you broke your hire. But Ginny was a hardworking wee girl, and she was there. She was very confident she could do the job. And an old man came along, and he put her up in the back of the cart. And as they're going along, and there's lots of repetition for you people to join in with, as they were going along, 
they said, uh, he said, to, now, if you want to keep this job, you have to do things exactly as I tell you. And she said, oh, yes, sir. No, we'll start there. What would you call me? Well, she said, um, master or mister, whatever you please. So he said, no, no, no. My name is Don Nippery Septo, master of all masters. And don't you forget it. Right, she said. And he brought her along and there was a low thatched farmhouse. What would you call that? She said, mm, a house or a cottage or whatever you please, sir. And he said, no, no, no. That's the great castle of Strawbungle. And don't you forget it. When they came in, there was a lovely fire going. She said, he said, what do you call that? She said, uh, fire, flame, whatever you please, sir. He said, no, no, no. That's the hot cockalorum. And don't you forget it. Sitting beside the fire was a black and white cat. What do you call that? And she, well, she was getting desperate. And I said, would it be a cat or a kitty or whatever you please? So he said, no, no, no. That's the white faced simony. Don't you forget it. Here, pull these off. And she was pulling off his boots. What do you call these? Um, boots or shoes or whatever you please, sir. And he said, no, 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 no. Those are my hay down treaders. And don't you forget it. Then he pointed at these trousers he was wearing. What do you call these? Trousers, pants, whatever you please, sir. He said, no, no, no. Those are my squibs and crackers. Don't you forget it. So he showed her up a little flight of stairs. He said, what do you call these? Steps or stairs, whatever you please, sir. He said, no, no, no. That's the wooden hill. And don't you forget it. She thought, I'm not going to keep this job. I'm not going to keep this job for a week. And when he took her up there, there was a little room. And in that room, there was a bed. And he said, what do you call that? Um, uh, bed, cot, whatever you please. No, that's your barnacle. Don't you forget it. So poor Jenny went to bed that night. When she blew out the candle, she thought, I'm not going to keep this job. Barnacle, straw bungle, white face simile, master of what, what are we going to do? But wasn't it well that she was a smart girl? Do you remember I told you that at the beginning? Because in the middle of the night, she heard an awful, Meow! and she ran down the stairs, took in what was happening. She said, don't let receptive master of all masters, quick, quick, get out of your barnacle, put on your hay down treaders and your scribs and crackers run down the wooden hill for the white-faced simile has put her tail in the hot cock alarm. Unless you get some water, some pond alarm to throw it out, the whole place is going to be on hot cock alarm. So that's how Ginny saved the house, the master, and her job. A very, very, very old English folk tale. And I hope you liked it. I haven't told that for ages. I'm done. In the middle of that story, welcome to my world, everybody. Out of my window here, I just saw an Austrian tourist appear with her backpack. She tried to get my door. Could you give me one tick till I just tell her that? This is dreadful. I'll just tell her where she is. I'll just. Hey, Louis. How are you? I missed you last week. Here we are. Oh, that you, Destin. How are you? So I've just I gesticulated. <clears throat> Shane, who's been to my house, knows that the barn is next door. So I'm going, oh, that way. I've everybody sitting waiting to greet her. Anyway, we get backpackers here. We get we have five students or five teachers here today. We have a thing in England and Wales and Northern Ireland and Scotland called the Duke of Edinburgh Award. We do it in Northern Ireland where young people go out and do challenges. And so there's some young people out walking 16 kilometres today. And their teachers all stay here, just keep an eye on them. They've had to send three of them home already because apparently fitness levels were not up to it. So welcome to my world. When I'm not telling stories, that's what I do. I greet people from all over the world. So with storytelling, people said to me, what's your favorite story? And of course, my favorite is one that I tell about my mother. So I'm not going to tell you that one. My favorite when I was a little girl was a, a story called The Three Billy Goats Gruff, which everybody here knows, I'm quite certain. And I love that story. And somebody asked me, somebody asked me the story. They asked me, when did I start telling stories? Of course, we all start telling stories as soon as we start to talk. But anyway, when I worked to, went to library school to learn to be a librarian, is there a DOE at the minute? I don't know, Mike. Certainly Duke of Edinburgh Ward's here, but I don't think there is a Duke of Edinburgh. I can't remember who he is these days. Certainly not Andrew. Anyway, so when I was at library school, I was asked to tell stories to children. I went, what? 
what? No, 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 no. I came to be a librarian because I like books and I sort of like people, but children, hmm, not so sure. So they said, no, this is part of what you do. You have to tell stories. So my first story I did tell was The Three Billy Goats Gruff. And the book was shaking and I was shaking because we read from the books in those days. Shaking, shaking. But the amazing thing was the children liked it. And I thought, wow, they like this. And that made me, as a very, very, very shy person, feel much better about myself because many storytellers are shy. And I've been telling stories ever since, a long, long time. So my favourite story about that story is one that several of my friends here know. And that what happened was I was telling stories in Belfast. Many of you adults know in Belfast there were some troubled times a long time ago. And I was telling stories. And when I got to the place where I was telling the stories, the place wasn't there anymore. There were just bricks and stones and glass. But there was a crowd of children waving. I went, right, adapt. So I put them up on a wall and I had my three Billy Goats graph with me, a Tommy DePaulo version. And I was tripping and trapping merrily over the bridge when an armour plated police vehicle came down the street. And my audience, to a boy and to a girl, leapt off the wall, picked up big stones and started throwing them at the police vehicle. And I'm standing there going, oh, I don't know these children, they're certainly not with me. And the next thing, when the vehicle went past, they all came back and sat on the wall for the end of the story. And that taught me really something very important, that no matter how fast our society urges children to grow up, where all of us like to hear the end of a good story, both children and adults. So that's uh, my story about three Billy Goats Gruff. What will I tell you next? I think I'll tell you one from Boom Chicka Boom. Will we pick it, we'll open it at random. Oh, we will. Ah, oh, well, tell my signature story from this book, and I'm sure you've heard other people tell versions of it. But this is a story I got way back in about 1983, something like that. And I heard a version of it from the late Thomas Cecil. And Tommy was a boatman in Rathlin Island. He brought people from the island to Ballycastle, a town about half an hour away from here. And we had a big event. Who says storytelling is just for kids? And 100 people turned up and they played that Thomas telling this story. And I've been telling it ever since. Unfortunately, a big ferry company took over the boat run, Caledonia McBrain. Thomas went back to being a deep sea diver. And sadly, he passed away with the bends, which is the thing that divers are very prone to. But this is my favourite story. Shane's been to Rathlin Island. I'm not sure if anybody else has been. A long time ago, on Rathlin Island, there lived a boy called Jim. He was about nine years old at the time this story happened. And oh, how he loved living on that island. I could take you there. It's very beautiful. It's got steep, rocky cliffs where birds nest. At the moment, the puffins are in. It's got big caves, and in one of those caves, a Scottish king called Robert the Bruce met a spider. But that's another story. I'm not going to tell you that one today. But Jim loved helping on the farm. They had sheep, and of course, this time of year, it would help with the lambs. They had a cow for milking, and they had hens. And he would go out, and he would lift the eggs that the hens would lay out under the hedges. But his favourite job of all, when it came to the autumn time, was picking blackberries, plump, juicy blackberries. He just loved doing that because he'd come home with blackberry juice all down his chin. He had as many as he picked, you know? So when he went out, he always wore his old clothes. Now, if you ask his children what you think he wore, oh, there were no football shirts or tracksuit bottoms. No, no. He wore an old pair of tweed trousers with big patches on them. He wore an old holy jumper that his mother would knit and she would patch and darn all the time. Because do you know what? He loved going out and getting really mucky and dirty. And if you, work, you live in a farm, you don't wear your good clothes when you go out. Now his mother, being a very good mother, said important things before he went out. One, come home before dark. Now, I'm hoping you people all know how important that is. But the other thing, especially if you come to visit me in Ireland is, don't be doing anything with the fairy trees. Because all over this country, You'll see an old fairy tree stand in the middle of the field. Farmers will never cut it down. It's treated with great respect because that's, of course, where the little people, the fairies live. And of course, I hope you all know, no matter what age you are, our fairies aren't sweet and lovely with gossamer wings like Tinkerbell. Our fairies can be very, very sneaky. They can play tricks. 
they are very cruel if you do something bad to them. So Jim had been warned. His mother sent him off, picked the blackberries, and she went on with her work. She thought she would make his favourite dinner. Now, I don't know what your favourite dinner is. Some of you can maybe tell me, oh, pizza. Somebody might say curry. The children always give me all oh, these things, spaghetti bolognese. I said, no, 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 no. Spaghetti had not made it to Rathlin Island at the time of this story. What do people in Ireland eat a lot of? Potatoes. So his mother made his favourite dinner, and here's a recipe coming up for all of you adults. She boiled potatoes. She heated up some milk and chopped into it spring onions or green onions, they call it in America. We call it scallions. She heated them up, big dollop of butter, twist of pepper, and mixed it into the boiled potatoes, and we call it chump. And it's just beautiful in a big pile with a big glob of butter in the top. Anyway, chump was already Jim, Jim, Jim. She started calling because she noticed it was getting dark. She was worried. She went to all her neighbor's door. She said, have you seen my boy? And he said, no. So they lit lamps. In those days, they had those hurricane lamps that they had. They had gone, Jim, Jim. And I've told you how, you know, there's cliffs on Rath and the seas there. It can be very dangerous for a boy or girl to go missing in the dark or anybody. The mother came home and sat by the fire and cried. The people couldn't go and search in the dark. So she had to wait there crying by the fireside until the search started again at first light. She waited all day long. She was sure her gym was in the sea or in a cave or somewhere. And then at supper time the next night, a full day went after he should have been home. She heard the door open. She heard the familiar footsteps on the quarry tile floor. She looked up and there he was and she hugged him. Now, like Millie's a mummy, she didn't know whether to be pleasant towards him or to be angry with him. And she said, what happened to you? And when she stood back and looked at him, this boy got completely different. This boy's face was scrubbed and shining. This boy's hair was gleaming. Even the back of his neck was clean. His old jumper had no holes, no tears, no darns. His old tweed trousers, no patches. He looked as though he was wearing a brand new clean rig out. Oh, he said, Mum, I went to tell you. I was coming home late. Yes, it was late. And I was com coming home past that tree you call the fairy tree. And there was a big bush of blackberries there. And I start, started to pick them. And all of a sudden, I felt myself being nipped and pinched. And I looked down, and there was a whole ring of little people, no bigger than my knee. Fairies. They grabbed me. They pulled me down onto the fairy hill. They plunged me into a big bath of soap and water. <clears throat> they scrubbed my face. They scrubbed my hair. Others were taking my clothes off, washing them. Fairy tailors were stitching them. And then his mother remembered a story that her granny had told her when she was a little girl that if the fairies ever capture a human boy or a human girl, and if inside one day they can be cleaned of every trace of this mortal world, when the fairies can keep them. But Jim was back home, safe and sound. She put him to bed. They said their prayers. She went on about her work, so on and doing bits. And all of a sudden, an hour later, he shouted, Mommy! And she ran in, he was sitting up in bed. He said, my finger's sore. And when she looked deep down under the nail, on the middle finger of his right hand was a thorn from a blackberry bush. And those fairies with all their scrubbing and all their cleaning had missed that tiny thorn. But it was just enough of a link to our world to bring him home safely again. So when you do come to Ireland, I hope you come soon. Desmond has definitely got to come. Lodi really have to come. When you come, you know, don't worry about it if you get caught in a branch or get your shoes scuffed because that's the one thing that will make sure you'll come home safe and sound and the fairies won't get you and that's my story one of my favorite favorite stories i see my big brothers online i'm very happy to see sean martin who's my big brother connecting into audio there um that's terrific that's a surprise for me great um, and do you know if you put it in the chat i might actually get reading it. do you love blackberries baba say yes i like blackberries in a pie how many did you bake? Four and twenty blackbirds baked in a pie. Uh, blackberries. Lovely. It's lovely to see people here. And Louis there too. Great. That would be considered probably my signature story for children. It's one I like. I was at a festival once and somebody who shall be nameless, I'm not going to tell you his name, is not somebody you would know very often, an Irish storyteller. 
It was far, far away. I was driving down to do my spot at the fest when he flagged down my car and he said, don't be telling that Wrath of an Island story because I've just told them it. And I went, oh, gee, thanks. That was really nice of you. Thank you very much indeed. Ah, so that's the sort of thing that happens from time to time. I suppose that's supposed to be um, a compliment. It's probably a compliment. Yeah, it's one of my stories. Saved by the thorn. You're absolutely right, Sue. Saved by the thorn, indeed. There's there are many stories, aren't there, about thorns, pricking fingers and so on. I really like, yeah. Yeah, he did warn me. At least he did. You're right, Mike. He did the same boy. He would take the eye out of your head, as they say. A magpie is what he is. So I'm going to tell you about Meg. Now, when I first was doing this book, a book that had influenced me when I was a very uh, young librarian was The Way of the Storyteller. Oh, so good. The Way of the Storyteller. Um, and I just, it was by Ruth Sawyer. And I loved the stories in it. And there was an Irish story in it. But of course, you can't just take somebody's story willy-nilly. And I did a bit of research and I found it was a traditional story. But I actually wrote to the publishers of that book and said, look, here's my version of the story. It's very different from that one. I want to credit the fact that I've read a version in your book. So I was allowed to put it in, into this book. And this is my version. Now, as people who know me will know, there's a type of child that I'm not very fond of. And that's called a whinge bag. Now, do you people in different parts know what a whinge bag is? I'm sure Despina knows. Papa C, do you not? One of those that goes, Oh, that fits my head astray. Whinging for no good reason. You know, my mother, I have to tell you, would have said, stop that. I'll give you something to whinge about. But I didn't whinge. Uh, I don't think, what did I whinge, Sean? I don't know, maybe I did whinge. But one of the things about a whinge bag is just they're I just horrible, horrible, horrible. I'm going to tell you two stories. We'll make it about a girl and a boy as well. So I'll tell you the girl one first, which is a favourite story, which you probably know. There was once a girl way down in County Fermanagh, and her name was Meg. She was an only child. Being an only child, she was spoiled rotten. All she had to do was, <laughs> and she got whatever she wanted. Now, people dreaded her coming with her parents to visit. Because if she'd come to my house, she'd say, I see you've still got those same old curtains up you had the last time. Mummy, there's a big chip out of my glass. Oh, horrible child. And the parents would smile and say, what a very observing child she was. And the people would say, that is one spoiled brat. But the thing I liked least about her was she was cruel to animals. She teased animals. Now, that just doesn't work in my book. And one day. She and her parents were out visiting a farm, and while the mother and father were in having a cup of tea with the farmer, she thought, what mischief could I be up to? And here, lo and behold, lying out in the yard was an old farm dog. He was one of those dogs that was on a chain, because he didn't want them running off, he didn't want them chasing sheep or anything. But, you know, she'd already disgraced herself with the farmer and his wife because they put up a perfectly good tea, and she said, oh, I don't want that, I don't like that. And so when she went out to the yard, and there was the dog, the dog was lying and he was on a chain and she thought, well, I'm going to go and pull his tail and then when he goes after me, he'll get choked. So she went over, she pulled the dog's tail, but this dog had been around a few corners, as we'd say, and was lying with his eyes half open, half shut. And when she pulled his tail, he sprang around and he just nipped her leg very gently. Mommy, that dog bit me, mommy. Everybody came running, farmer and his wife, mother and father, farm hands came running. Some said, get rid of the dog. Other people, more of them said, would you not get rid of, rid of the wee girl? And when she heard people talking about her like that, she took off up to the fields to see what more mischief she could get up to. Now, at that time, the men would be out with horses and carts bringing in the hay. And I don't know, I was talking to older people about this yesterday. The farmer's wife would bring out your food to you and put it in under the hedge to keep it cool. Now the food in those days would be like bread and cheese wrapped in a cloth maybe, or there'd be a bottle full of cold tea with a stopper in it. And of course, I'm sure you can guess what she did. She ate a bit here, she drank a bit here, she ate a bit here, she drank a bit here, and worse than that, she scattered what she didn't want over this nearby grassy hill, the plot thickens. She was a bit tired. She lay down and she fell asleep. When she woke up, it was dark. There was a moon shining and she heard voices saying, oh, if I could get my hands on that girl, look at the state of our dancing place. Now, anybody with any wit would know to shut up, but not her up. She gets, here I am, who wants me? 
And the next thing, she was surrounded by a ring of angry fairies. Ring, ring, fairy, ring, fairies, dance, fairies, sing. And they pulled up a tuft of grass and they pulled her right down under the fairy hill, a bit like the other boy. They brought her into a room. And this room was full of food. There was a lumpy porridge. There was cold cabbage. There was greasy stew. And they said, do you see that? That is all the perfectly good food that your mother made for you. You left lying behind you. You are not going to get one bite to eat or one sup to drink to you that all cleared up. And they gave her a brush and a brush pan and she had to sweep it all up. When she finished, she said, can I go home? I know you can't. And they gave her a glass of milk and a piece of wheat and bread. And she was so hungry, she wolfed it down. The second room they took her into was full of clothes. Torn clothes, stained clothes, tattered clothes. Do you see that? Those are all the good clothes that your mother has worked so hard with to make for you. And you just wear something for half an hour, drop it, wear something else. You won't get a bite to eat or sup to drink. You've all that cleared up. Now, you people will know, but I have to explain to the wee ones. There were no washing machines in those days. She had a big wash tub. She had a washboard. And her hands were raw by the time she rubbed everything. And then she had to wring it out. There wasn't even a mangle at that time. And then she set out the stuff to dry over the hedges. So it took some time. And the next thing, she had to iron it all. Now again, no electricity. The irons were heated up in the fire. But as you know, not too many irons in the fire at once. So she heated them up. She ironed all the coals. Can I go home now? No, you can't. They gave her another cup of milk, wheat and bread, and they brought her into the third room. This third room, well, it was like a jungle. There were big spiky weeds with big thorns on them. And here and there, in between, a little pink flower, a little blue flower, a little yellow flower, and she had the wit to say, oh, those wee flowers are going to get choked by all those weeds. <laughs> I'm glad you noticed. Those weeds are all the nasty, horrible things you've said about people over the years. And those wee flowers are the few kind things that you have ever said. Nobody even had to tell her what to do. She started to weed. And she weeded and weeded and weeded. Her hands were sore. But at last, the wee flowers looked lovely. And she smiled. She said, that's better. And the next thing, she's out in the air, dancing around. Ring, ring, fairy, ring, fairies dance, fairies sing. Now, do you know how to get home if you've been taken by the fairies? wonder do you there's a few ways my friend Isabel in Switzerland knows all about this you look for a four-leaf clover like a shamrock with an extra leaf and she was so observant she grabbed on she said I wish I was home in my own house and bing she was lying in her own bed but she had been lying there for a year and a day unable to speak unable to hear she'd been away with the fairies all that time we'll come back to that in a minute she said, oh, mummy, I'm sorry I teased that dog. That dog wouldn't have bit me if I hadn't teased him. And her mother said, glory be, our Meg's back to us again. Well, to cut a long story short, that girl grew up into a fine young woman. She never whinged, she never moaned, she never whined, that's the word. She never whined. No, she was a really nice girl. And if you were to go to County Fermanagh, to this day, I go there quite often, and you were to meet a nice, well-behaved boy or girl, you would nearly say that would be a great, great grandchild of we Meg Barney Lake. And that's the story. And I hope you like that story. And you know, the whole thing about being away with the fairies interests me. Because you'll say about people here would say, see your man there, he's away with the fairies, meaning it's just a wee bit maybe touch. But you imagine in the olden days, if somebody had an accident, was knocked out, was unconscious. We know nowadays, you sit with the person, you talk with the person, you play the music, you show them, talk about their favourite football stars, you maybe put TV on. And we know sometimes they'll come back to us. But in the olden days, as far as you were concerned, your person was away with the fairies. And this was a wrap with your left. So that away with the fairies things interests me. If any of you adults would like a good book to read, read Away by Jane Urquhart, who's a Canadian author. And that book takes you between Rathlin Island and Canada. And it's basically, it's got a bit about the fairies in it. So that's a book for you adults. It's a novel. I hope you like it. So there you are. Is my brother still on? Oh, yes, he is. Oh, this is very good. Excellent. Um, brothers tell good scary stories sometimes, you know, and uh, I'm not going to tell scary stories today because it's still light and it's early and small people might listen to this and I don't want to scare them at all. But I'm going to tell you a story about my second whinge bag. I told you I'd tell you one about a boy. 
And this boy is called Ben. And he was the whingiest. It wasn't the same sort of though. But the thing was, the minute he got his holidays from school, do you know what his parents did? I'm sure you can guess. They sent him off to stay with Granny and Granddad for the holidays. And of course, that was great. All he had to do was whinge. Oh, Granny will get you something else, pet. That's the way. So Granny and Granddad, and you have to join in with this story, there's a wee bit of participation. Granny and Granddad always tried to get his favourite food. And again, I could ask you what you think his favourite food was. It's very much a granny thing in Ireland. It was stew. She made a big pot of stew in America. You call it stew. Stew, we call it. And she doled out a big bowl of stew and he started to win. <laughs> she said, what are you talking about, Pep? It's your favourite. Granny made it special. There's no brown bread. And right enough, if you come to Ireland, you know, no stew is complete without some lovely wheaten bread. Don't you worry, Pep. Granda will run me down to the shop. Now you keep the door locked. Don't let anybody in the door. We'll be back in a minute. That's how spoiled he was. Horrible child. Of course, the minute he got his own way, he started to smile. They went off to the shop, which wasn't far. But in the woods near their house, there lived a fox. And her name was Soxy. And you'll never guess what she liked to eat more than anything in the whole world. And don't be telling me boys, because boys are very tough. She liked to eat stew. So she came, knocked on the door, said, hello, open the door, let me in, Soxy the fox. He said, no. Nanny said not to open the door. Nanny said not to open the door. Hmm. Did she mention the window? No. Well, listen, you open the window, you let me in, I'll take you for a ride on my tail three times around the kitchen. Would that be good? Mm. You like that? So he opened the window. Soxy came straight in, <laughs> ate all the stew. Hop on my back, he hopped on Soxy's back, three times around the kitchen, out the window, with Ben going, <laughs> I want, I want, I want, I want my granny. Oh, she said, please stop that whinging and moaning, please stop that whining. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm just taking you back to my den because I've got cubs there, you see. And he makes such a mess, chicken bones and feathers. I just need a hand to clear it up. Meanwhile, who comes back from the shop but granny and granddad? Yoo-hoo, Ben! No, Ben. Just an empty stew pot and footprints out the window and a strong smell of fox, which I'm sure some of you know. That fox has got our boy. Quick, we have to get him back. Granda, Granda says, go and get your bagpipes. Now this, I'm hoping, is where you all learn to play the bagpipes. Granny went and she got a saucepan and a spoon, a pot and a spoon. So Granda got his bagpipes. Now, for you bagpipe players there, here's what you have to do. You have to hold your nose and go watching. I have to go, ah, brilliant. If you are playing the saucepan and the spoon, you go bang, 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 bang. Could you try that? Bang, bang, bang. Good, Shane. Bang, bang. Wonderful. And then what you have to say is, Soxy, Soxy, in your den, bring us back our little Ben. Isn't that easy? So off they go to the fox's den and first ground starts. Here we go, everybody. Bang, 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 bang. Soxy, Soxy, in your den, bring us back our little Ben. In the den, the fox said, who is making that noise? One of you cubs, go up, find out who's making that noise and tell them to stop it at once. For I've got a headache, a nose ache, a tummy ache, a toes ache, and a very bad tail ache. So little fox went up and said, oh. <laughs> Mummy says, could you please stop making that horrible noise? Because she's got a headache, a nose ache, a tummy ache, a toes ache, and a bad tail ache. Shoo! Into the bag. And the little fox. They started again. Everybody ready? <laughs> bang, 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 bang. Soxy, soxy, in your den. Bring us back our little bin. <sighs> Where's your brother got to? Go up. Tell whoever's making that noise to stop it at once because I've got a headache, a nose ache, a tummy ache, a toes ache and a very bad tail ache. Got one more. <laughs> Mummy said could you please stop making that horrible noise at once because she's got a headache, a nose ache, a tummy ache, a toes ache and a shoo, in the back. This is your last chance people. <laughs> bang, 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 bang. Soxy, soxy in your den. Bring us back our little Ben. And the fox just thought you know something? If you want a job doing, you've got to do it yourself. Up she went, she said, excuse me, I, I don't know who you people are, 
I don't really know what you want, but could you please stop making that horrible noise because I've got a headache, a nose ache, a tummy ache, a toes ache, and a very bad tail ache too. Really, said Granny, guess what I've got in the bag? And the bag was jumping, love, love. You've got our cubs, yes, and you've got our grandson. Perhaps we could talk. So they talked. Granny and Grandad released the little cubs. Ben came up, fine. No chicken bones, no feather, just a few bits and pieces of scraps, you know, a little smelly perhaps, and they brought him home. After that, he was the nicest boy, said please, thank you, as he was told. But sometimes at night when they'd sit with Granny and Grandad, they'd remember that story and they'd sing together very quietly. Soxy, soxy, in your den, bring us back our little Ben. And that's the story of a boy called Ben and a fox called Soxy. And it was given to me by a dear, dear friend called Sheila Quigley. And I tell it in her memory. And I just love it. You should see, if you have 100 children in front of you, oh, you can have some fun. And of course, I make the teachers do the bagpipes and uh, it's good fun. So I'm trying to share just some of my favorite children's stories. I think it's a really important thing um, to share some of these because it's not all about the big performances, you know. I, I love it when you get a, a little grip around you. And uh, I was telling the students today, I would do a lot of work with people of different abilities and backgrounds. So I had a group of preschool children. I had a group of women from the local community and I had six elderly people from the local nursing home, most of whom were living with dementia and the heads were down and I was giving it my all. And what did I do? I should have brought them out for you. I brought my teddy. I have a teddy bear that my big brother, Billy, sent from uh, Germany when he was in the Air Force there when I was, I don't know, Sean, I was maybe about three or something. Um, and I brought out my teddy bear. And all of a sudden, this old woman who hadn't shown any reaction to him starts singing, me and my teddy bear, got no worries, got no cares. Me and my teddy bear, we'll play and play all day. I haven't sung that song for over 60 years. And yet, of course, we remember it. So I absolutely love singing uh, songs that just get everybody involved. I'm going to do a picture book story. I'm coming up near the end now. My father used to say I was vaccinated with a gramophone needle. We did a project, Colin was doing a project lately with uh, preschool or with elderly people and 11 year olds and they brought a record player and they'd never seen a record player before. They didn't know what a record player was. What they really didn't know was, was a chamber pot that would be kept under the bed called a gazunder. Colin brought his gazunder and they couldn't get their heads around the fact that people didn't go to the bathroom. Anyway, we won't go there. But uh, I'm going to tell you a picture book story. It was written originally to credit it by a man called H.E. Todd. And people who grew up in Britain would have known books about Bobby Brewster. He did a whole series of books about Bobby Brewster. But I want to ask you a question. Actually, one can unmute oneself in time here. We'll ask Sue first of all. Sue, what noise does a cow make, please? Mm. Pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. Um, Despina. What noise does a dog make, please, in Greece? Ah, okay. That goes, love them. See, very different. I love doing this with people from different nationalities. All right. Can somebody tell me what noise, oh, Baba C could do this. What noise does a duck make? Quack, quack. Perfect. Perfect. I think that, oh, I know. We need one more. Mike, what about a cat? Meow. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, there's my teddy bear. It looks like an old one like mine. It looks very like my teddy. Anyway, here's the story. One day, a farmer was driving around the farm on his big red tractor when he saw one of his cows lying in the field looking very sad. And the farmer said, good morning, cow. How are you? And the cow said, bark, bark. The farmer thought, mm, something wrong here. I don't think cows go, bark, bark. I think they go, moo. Mm. So he went back to the farm and he got a bottle of medicine and he got a big spoon and he tried to get in between the wharf and wharf and it was no good. So, of course, you all know who to send for if you've got a sick animal. You send for the vet. So the vet came and the vet said, how now, cow? And the cow said, wharf, wharf. Oh, a clear case of dog's disease. All we have to do is give her a dog's disease tablet. Now, vets are very clever. He took a long white tube, he put one end in the cow's mouth, he put the tablet in the other, he blew it. Should be fine. The next morning, we're coming up to the end of our story. Don't worry, John. The next morning, he said, how are you? And she said, Ew. yes, she should dog's disease today, she cat's disease. This is beyond me. We have to send for the big doctor. He came by helicopter. 
When he got there, she was making a noise like your dog. Wah, wah. He said, get up. She didn't like being spoken to like that. No, run around the field. The last thing she felt like. But just when she was in the middle of a tall clump, a very pretty thistles, he showed her, sit down. She sat down, plonk, and the jaggy thistles, and moo. She rose in the air. Repeat that. Moo. And from that day to this, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, that cow never said anything but moo, which goes to prove what a very, very clever man that was. And of course, the farm was delighted and invited everybody home to the farm for tea. So that's my lot. That's my stories. Thank you very much for listening to my stories. I'll be reading the chat afterwards. I hope you enjoyed them. I hope my big brother, Sean, enjoyed them. I hope so too. I don't see him, but I know he's there. And I hope uh, the rest of you, whether you're on Facebook or whether you're there, enjoyed it. So thank you, John, for the invitation. Lovely well, thank to see you, Liz. Friends. It was amazing. Louis, you're our litmus test. Uh, did you enjoy that, Louis? Yes, I did. Thank you. Good, Louis. Good. Right. That's great. Right. Thank we, you we very have, much. We have, to, Thank you. we have to do our customer survey afterwards, and Louis is our customer survey. Yeah. Right. So, uh, thank you, Liz. That was fantastic. Uh, when you said, don't worry, John, I'm coming to the end, I had lost sense of all sense of time, <laughs> of course, and I was just away with the fairies. Okay. Uh, good, 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 uh, good. So, what have we got coming up? Well, oh, well, uh, uh, next Friday, we've got Amir Burke. Which uh Emer's great, yeah. And that that's uh Amy Burke and she's amazing and you will enjoy her. Um we're we're very Irish this month, apart from our little Greek week. Um and the spinner was <laughs> the spinner was doing the Greek week, but apart from that, it's been all Ireland. Um and uh, tomorrow uh we had with the Ace Innovation, which is a sort of Indian Singapore organization, is running a uh, a 24 hour uh, fundraiser for sto with stories, 24 hour storytelling, uh, raising money for the Turkish victims of the Turkish earthquake. Oh, fantastic. Um, we're doing at the cafe, we're doing seven till nine uh, UK and Irish time. Um, if anyone Irish comes on, I'll, I'll put them on at the beginning because then they can get across to the barn. They'll have time to get across to the barn. Uh, which, uh, oh, for my 8.30 session. Yes, every Saturday night, 8.30. So yeah. I saw my big brother there. He's just disappeared again, but he was yeah. there. So was everyone, the anyone is what a usual thing. Come on, press the gold button and you cut you, you and that gets you in. And that between seven, anyone who wants to tell a tale is welcome. And I'll just keep an eye. And if anyone has to get away early, it's going to be really late in Greece. So I'm going to put you on last this minute. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, uh, but if anyone has to be anywhere else, uh, let me know. But we've got two hours uh, of this 24 hours. And of course, there'll be a link to the, where people can go and listen to the, the rest, which is very timetable. I think they've got 180 tellers from 186 store, uh, countries so far, um, which are 186 tellers from different countries, but got countries from all over the world. Um, and there'll be a QR code where people can donate. I don't know how that works, but of course the QR code is, um, is uh, I always fail miserably with those things, but there'll be a, that's a simple way to donate. And hopefully they'll raise a lot. What have we got coming? Oh, well, of course, on Tuesday, as, as every Tuesday, we have my favourite programme. Liz will understand why it's my favourite programme. We've got our young international tellers, which is tellers under the age of 25. Um, we have regulars. We have uh, Kenza from uh, Italy, um, and she who comes on regularly. She couldn't last week; she's a bit old. But uh, and she's she's and this is lovely because we're getting stories that have never been published from her that have come from her uh, her Moroccan mother and grandmother. So we're um, and we're going to produce. She's. She's going to work on over the summer to put them in a book and the cafe is going to publish that book. So we'll have a book of Juha stories that are never, that have never been published before from a child who got them from her mother and grandmother. That's and fantastic. That, it, that's how it should work. Um, so, uh, and, uh, and, and then we, we've got a young lady from Ponjab who comes on regularly, Nigeria, occasionally when they can get on the internet, uh, 
Gaza Strip. So we have mm. children from, it's a small group of children. Everyone's welcome. But of course, because we go out live on Facebook, I think a, a lot of people are very shy from uh, uh, from, from, from Britain and so forth about ch having children live on Facebook, which I can sure. understand. But of course, I, I'm, I'm dealing with, with countries where signing anything is dangerous. So uh, I can't ask for permissions. Um, mm. But John, I'm going to have to go tonight. This is the go. Antrim Flower. You know about the Antrim Flower, the flower of the festival. And the Antrim Flower has actually been hosted in Cushion Door. And tonight's the big flower concert with people that some of the people... Well, what are you doing with us, Liz? Go, go. No, yeah, no. Give uh, a big I, round I, of applause. Do my time. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for coming to listen. Thanks to all the people on Facebook. I hope you enjoyed listening to some of my favourite, favourite stories. All the very best. Well, thank I'm you. Uh, Bye -bye. marvellous thank you fantastic uh, come along tomorrow uh, those who can come along on Tuesday to support our young tellers if you've got young tellers that want that, that, uh, to that want to tell that's 5 o'clock on a Tuesday UK time meanwhile goodbye and Waleed thank you and enjoy I hope you get to your before you get back to us I hope you get your eat breakfast in the morning uh, that is uh uh, 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 Eid was not Thursday in Morocco, as we thought. It is Saturday, so um, but well, he's going to be with us tomorrow, but but later, and I'm hoping he gets his uh, Eid breakfast beforehand. Okay.